Good morning, everybody. Um, so today um, is the, uh, uh, of course, it's the day long, and the theme is uh, recollections of Ajahn Chah. And uh, it's actually the first time I've taught a day long at Spirit Bronx. So this is a new experience for me, and uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> the uh, in uh, um, considering the theme of, of uh, yeah, recollections of Ajahn Chah, then um, uh, I could give a, a bit of background um, for my own connection with Ajahn Chah. Uh, I first heard um, of him in probably late 1973. I was uh, practicing in a monastery on the outskirts of Bangkok, where I, um, I actually took a, in my idea, a temporary ordination for three or four months, uh, just to uh, get a bit of experience and uh, go on my way. Um, I had places to go and things to do, <laughs> and. Uh, and then I kept hearing of Ajahn Chah. I kept hearing of the forest monks up in the northeast of Thailand. So that uh, I, in early 1974, I took a, a, my ordination was the beginning of January and, I don't know, late January, early February or something like that. I went up to uh, the northeast of Thailand to pay respects to Ajahn Chah. And to, uh, and when I arrived at the monastery, uh, I went in, um, it was early morning, uh, monks had just finished their alms round, and, and there's this scene of stillness, but then activity, and the monks are all quiet, going about there. Uh, coming back from alms round, I went up and uh, paid respects to Ajahn Chah, and uh, did my three bows, and then he just sort of looked at me and said, if you want to stay here, you have to stay at least five years. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction to Ajahn Chah as a person. And uh, that... Uh, <laughs> Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. How are you? I was actually going to bring a, a big big one this morning this morning. How do we get it? Oh, thank you, Jen. Let's give a how do we do it? I'm not sure. Can we get it? This, maybe if it were propped up on the side there, that would I think that's Without some special prompts, oh. give me. Is that going to work? Kovilo, could you pull that that out? Yeah. Pull that forward. Is that okay? Pull that forward. No, the the with the antennas. Oh, is that's going to work. Is that all right? Yeah, that's going to work. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Wow, thank you. Pleasure to bring him in. He says, he says, um, I'm kind of big this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a big presence. <laughs> Uh, that's what I was uh, contemplating bringing a. Uh, we have a large picture of, of Ajahn Chah up in our new building, and uh, uh, we're we're thinking about bringing it. But then our van is off with a group of monks, uh, and we had it was a bit of a scramble to get uh, transportation together. We hardly had enough space for ourselves and a and a cup of tea this morning <laughs> in the vehicle. So um, there's, and the the image that uh, uh, we were going to bring was uh, uh, it's actually a needlepoint. It was offered 
uh, villagers at, at uh, uh, Bung Wai, which is the, where the International Forest Monastery is. There's, it's something that they started doing this last year or so. And uh, various people have been, been, been doing these needle points of Ajahn Chah. And it'll take six months, nine months, a year to do a real act of faith. And then they just finish this uh, one particular uh, person. They just finished theirs. They've been working on it nine months, and they just came and offered it to, to bring to a Vaigiri. So it's, uh, uh, well, we didn't bring it down. So we have this one, which is a, is a wonderful uh, uh, image of, of Ajahn Chah. And as we, we go through the day, I'll, I'll try to, I've probably got way more material than I can possibly uh, cover uh, and still have time to do sitting and walking. Um, but I'll try to hit some points along the way of, of Ajahn Chah's life, uh, Ajahn Chah's training, how he uh, trained, how he also changed. Uh, during his his uh, uh, his his life, or some of the difficulties he also experienced, um, and I'm going to be trying to um, do it by using a material that is um, mostly not available um, to. Uh, uh, it's not in books yet. It's not. Uh, uh, a lot of it's in the uh, uh, kind of manuscript form uh, that uh, we have. Um, uh, there's a uh, Ajahn Jayasaro uh, has been uh, working on for many years. Uh, he was responsible for the biography that was created um, at the uh, for the funeral ceremonies of Ajahn Chah, and uh, it has yet to be put into English. And because one of the reasons he realized is that you can't actually do a translation. You need to do a whole new book that is geared for a Western audience. So uh, uh, that's been taking time. And, uh, and he's a procrastinator. Uh, and he's been living on his own now. And he said, he's, uh, uh, I was talking to him recently, and he said that's now he's uh, with all the years of solitude, he's been turning into a world-class procrastinator. So, <laughs> so that, uh, um, but he's been working on a lot of that, and uh, so I want to to use some of that material, um, and uh, and then uh, also uh, um, use some. I pulled together some of Ajahn Chah's. Um, instructions on meditation so that when we do the meditations uh, rather than me doing uh, uh, in, uh, instruction then I'll be relying on, on Ajahn Chah's uh, instructions in meditation so that uh, that'll be the, the, uh, the overall scheme of the day uh, and I think because I uh, have never uh, done a, uh, a day long here, uh, then I actually had to email Ajahn Amaro and say, what do you do anyway? <laughs> what am I supposed to do when I get there? Uh, so that uh, I'll, I'll follow. He, he sent a, me an email and gave me a basic outline of how he, how he usually uh, runs a day long so that uh, I'll, uh, I'll follow that, uh, uh, that kind of format, that, that schedule, more or less. Um, and the and I think um, one of the you know to begin with I'll just take um, some from some things from Ajahn Chah's life. These are recollections of, of Ajahn Chah and uh, uh, to get a sense of um, who he was, where he came from. Um, and I can only just skim and hit points. Um, but uh, 
hopefully it'll get a, a flavor of how um, somebody um, who had such a, an effect on so many people uh, because, say, now in the West there must be, I don't know, 15, 20 monasteries that are affiliated with, with Ajahn Chah. Uh, in Thailand there must be 300, I would think. Uh, when there's a gathering, uh, once a year, uh, on the anniversary of his uh, of his death and cremation, there's a uh, uh, a gathering uh, to pay respects to him, and uh, there's usually about a, a about a thousand monks show up, and and uh, several hundred nuns. 10,000 lay people, 12, it's hard to count when it gets to those numbers. Um, so that, uh, uh, and they all live at Ajahn Chah's monastery uh, at, during that time, uh, usually under, under the trees. It's, it's, Ajahn Chah was very convenient. Uh, he was a good organizer, so that when he died, it was, he died at a very convenient time. Uh, it was sort of the beginning of the cool season when it's, uh, it's not so hot that it's difficult to gather and it's not, uh, it's sort of early enough after the, the rains have ended that the, there's still enough water in the wells to supply uh, uh, the, the, uh, the wells with water to deal with all these people. Um, so it's a, they'll all be living there and there'll be people coming uh, from all around the country every day. So it's usually about a week of practice and, and teachings uh, being given throughout that time. And, and you see the, the I impact that Ajahn Chah had uh, in Thailand and then, of course, in our own way in the West, uh, the impact and inspiration that he's given to so many people. So I'll just uh, uh, do a bit of reading from uh, different different places. Um, Ajahn Chah was born into an, an affectionate and respected household, one of the wealthier families in a close-knit community. The, east, the northeastern villages of those days, isolated by forests and vulnerable to the vagaries of the weather and the caprice of spirits, put great store on sharing, generosity and harmony. The model was of an extended family, and over the years, Marriages between inhabitants of a village tended to make it one, in fact. Houses were made of wood, roofed with grass thatch, and raised on stilts as protection from floods and wild animals. They were placed close together with no fixed boundaries between them. Life was conducted on a large open space upstairs, with rooms used only for sleeping. People not only heard their neighbors' family dramas, they could see them as well. But there was no concept of privacy much less a desire for it. The villagers subscribed to respect for monks, elders, and spirits, consideration for the feelings of others, and a sense of shame. They relished laughter and conversation. Ajahn Chah grew up with a strong sense of community and place, and the gift of the gab. The adject adjective that was often used to describe Ajahn Chah in his old age, ebullient, is the one that comes most readily to mind when picturing him as a child. He was a chunky, exuberant young lad, and yet, at the same time, keen and perceptive. Nobody's fool. He was full of fun and vigor, with the sunny, buoyant disposition so common to the Laos. And that's the area of Thailand that Ajahn Chah grew up in, is a Lao-speaking and more Lao culture. The northeastern Thai is a, is a, is a Lao uh, their roots are more in, in, in Laos. And actually, when I first arrived in, Thailand, in northeast of Thailand, we're first setting up the um, monastery to, um, for, the, for the, the international community. Uh, the old people oftentimes say, rather than say, oh, I'll be going down to Bangkok, or my children are going down to Bangkok, they would say, oh, they're going to Thailand. <laughs> so it's a distinct uh, uh, say, 
uh, say language and culture. Uh, but even then he showed a glint of steel in his ways. He was both a talker and a doer, the natural leader of his group of friends, the one whom everyone wanted to be close to and without whom all games and adventures seemed dull. Ajahn Chah bore the round face and flat lion's nose common to his race. More distinctively, his mouth was unusually wide and compelling, as if destined one day to have memorable things to say. While in charming contrast to the powerful symmetry of his face, his right ear was larger than the left. His childhood friends remember Ajahn Chah's mildness. They say he never enforced his dominance with bullying or coercion. No one can recall him in a fight. He was a mediator in his companions' disputes and from an early age was drawn by the yellow robe. He relates a childhood memory of playing the role of a monk. He would sit sternly on an old bamboo bed with a uh, pakoma, it's an all, all-purpose cloth that the, the villagers use. They usually wrap it around. They do all sorts of things with it. It's usually wrapped around their waist. Uh, with, a, with the pakoma dra draped over his left shoulder like a robe. And his friends would play the parts of the laity. <laughs> <laughs> the mealtime is probably the only event in the monk's daily life that is interesting enough to lend itself to drama, and it was that which the children would enact. Ajahn Chah would ring a bell, and his friends would bring a tray of fruit and cool water. <laughs> After bowing three times, they would offer it to him meekly. He, in turn, would give them the th five precepts of the Buddhist layperson and a blessing. So, these are very early days. <laughs> it was at the age of nine that Ajahn Chah asked permission from his parents to move out of the family home and into the local monastery. It was a common practice for parents to entrust sons to the monks, but rare for a boy to volunteer. Many years later, Ajahn Chah spoke of his decision in the following way. Well, the causes and conditions were there. As a boy, I had a fear of committing evil actions. I was always a straightforward lad. I was honest, and I didn't tell lies. When there were things to be shared out, I was considerate. I would take less than my due. That basic nature just kept maturing until one day I said to myself, go to the monastery. I asked my friends if they had ever thought of doing the same thing, and none of them had. The idea just arose naturally. I'd say it was the fruit of past actions. As time went on, wholesome qualities steadily grew inside me until one day they led me to decide and do as I did. On another occasion, in a more humorous vein, Ajahn Chah told some lay disciples that he had become uh, a monastery child because he was tired of watering the family tobacco fields <laughs> and because the humdrum daily round of chores was so tedious and re repetitive. And he says, I was just a small little child. I'd never smoked tobacco in my life. But even so, first thing in the morning, as soon as I got up, I was driven off to the fields to water tobacco plants, hundreds of them. It was infuriating. <laughs> As one of Ajahn Chah's sisters remembers it, a small accident brought things to a head. Him going to live in the monastery wasn't arranged by our parents. It was his own idea. One day he was helping his brothers and sisters pounding rice, but he wasn't putting much heart into it. Well, it so happened the pounder slipped out and we had to drive in a wedge to keep it firm. He wouldn't help. But then, while the rest of us were doing it, he got hit by the wood while we, we were using as a mallet. It must have hurt him because he got angry and shouted out, That's it. I'm going to go and be a monk. <laughs> <laughs> so that's nine years old. He, uh, uh, so he ordained as a novice, uh, and, uh, and he did his studies, and, uh, and then when he was, uh, uh, around the time he was 16, uh, then uh, his teacher, 
uh, the, at, the, at the monastery would take him over to their house, uh, his family home, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, um, and he would, uh, uh, it ended up that his, uh, um, his, his, uh, his, his sort of, his, his teacher, um, had fall, he'd, he'd fallen for fallen in love with Ajahn Chah's sister, and then ended up disrobing and uh, to marry Ajahn Chah's sister. So that put some turmoil into Ajahn Chah's mind, and then um, and then with just natural sixteen years old, there's a draw to the world. So he left uh, uh, being a novice and. Um, Went back and um, um, helped out with uh, um, the uh, uh, the family fields, and it's a agri agrarian society. And uh, so then he uh, then he says, and he was, uh, 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 and then he also uh, had. Uh, uh, his own sort of attraction to uh, to a girl, he said, and then he relates this himself. When uh, when I was eighteen, I liked a girl; she liked me too. And as these things go, after some time of liking her, I fell deeply in love. I wanted to marry her. I daydreamed about having her by my side, helping me out in the fields, making a living together. Then one day, on my way home from work, I met my best friend put on the road. He said. Cha, I'm taking the lady. When I heard those words, I went completely numb. I was in a state of shock for hours afterwards. I remembered the prediction of an, of an astrologer that I would have no wife but many children. At that time, I wondered how it could be possible. And then the, the narrative goes on. Simply, and with the unquestioned prerogative that parents of his age and culture possessed, Put's father and his wife had decided that their two stepchildren should marry. There was no more to be said. Uh, the reasons were pragma pragmatic, economic. If Put married Jai, Jai was the, the girl's name, if Put married Jai, the family would be saved a bride price they could ill afford. They had just acquired land some distance from the village that should not be left fallow. The young couple could move out there and farm it together. Ajahn Chah, despite the coming of the rains, must have felt his life suddenly beached in a dry and desolate land. But other than trying to reconcile himself to the situation, what could he do? It made no sense to be angry with Put. His friend had not plodded behind his back and was painfully embarrassed by the whole affair. But this disappointment was a profound one, a sharp and hurtful lesson in the uncertainties that bedevil human affairs. Where should you? Where could you? place your trust. Ajahn Chah maintained his friendship with Put, and indeed it was to last for the rest of Ajahn Chah's life. But with Jai, he had to be more circumspect. His feelings could not be denied by an act of will. Even after becoming a monk, if Ajahn Chah saw her in the, in the monastery, he would have to do his utmost to avoid a meeting that might stir up painful emotions. Ajahn Chah admitted that for the first seven years of his monkhood, it was impossible to completely let go of his thoughts of Jai. Perhaps, after all, by some miracle, she became free. The same tantalizing scenarios periodically recurred in his mind, the same facile, happy endings. Could he then, in such a case, remain in the robes? He didn't know. It was only when he finally left his familiar surroundings and through meditation practice gained a method of stilling his thoughts and seeing them in perspective that the fantasies faded. In later years, as abbot of Wat Nompapong, describing to the monks the drawbacks of sensual desire, he would often talk of the debt of gratitude he owed to Put. If he hadn't married Jai, if he hadn't married Me Jai, then I probably wouldn't be here today, he would say. Perhaps. At the same time, one can't help but assume that if there had not been this particular obstacle to a conventional married life, another would surely have emerged. He says, I was fed up. I didn't want to live with my parents. The more I thought about it, the more fed up I became. 
I just wanted to go off by myself the whole time. But to where, I didn't know. I felt like that for a number of years. I was fed up, but not with anything in particular. I just wanted to go somewhere and be alone. These were the feelings I had before I became a monk. I wasn't fully conscious of them, but they were there all the same, all of the time. And then, um, because at the age of 20 is when you can be ordained as a a fully ordained monk, and it's also the time when you're you're up for the military draft as well in Thailand. (laughs) So that oftentimes this is very much the case where they wait and see, um, you know, am am I drafted? Do I go in the military? Do I become a monk for a period of time? Uh, So, this next section. Ajahn Chah's name was missing from the list of young men from Ubon called up for national service. He was now free to ask for admission into the monkhood, but by this time his ideas about becoming a monk had changed. He no longer considered it simply in terms of making merit for his parents, an expression of the gratitude he felt towards them. These were certainly noble aims, but he desired something more something that could resolve the dis-ease in his heart. Lay life seemed hollow and tedious. Perhaps the monastic life could lead him to meaning and peace. He decided to become a monk for an indefinite period. His mother and father were pleased. They had enough children to help with the farm work, and it was auspicious to have a son in robes. The admission ceremony took place on the 26th of April, 1939, at Wat Gaw Nai, the local monastery. Uh, Prakru in Desarakun was Ajahn Chah's preceptor and conferred on him the monk's name of Subato, which means well-developed. Ajahn Chah spent the first two years of his monastic life at Wat Gaw, uh, so that his, in his home village, studying the teachings, and he retook the first level of monastic studies, Naktam Kri, which is, he would have done that as a novice as well. And then he, he gives a Uh, him speaks himself. When I first became a monk, I didn't train myself, but I had faith. Maybe I was born with it, I don't know. At the end of the rains retreat, the monks and novices who joined the sangha at the same time, at the same time as me, all disrobed. I thought, what's wrong with them? But I didn't dare to say anything, because I still didn't trust my own feelings. My friends were excited at leaving, but to me, they seem foolish. I considered how difficult it was to enter the Sangha and how easy to disrobe. I thought how lacking in merit they must be to look on the worldly path as more beneficial than that of Dhamma. That's how I looked at it. But I said nothing. I kept my thoughts to myself. I'd watch my fellow monks and novices come and go. Sometimes before disrobing, they try on their lay clothes and and parade up and down. I thought they were completely insane. But they thought they looked good, that their clothes were smart, and they talked about the things they were going to do after they disrobed. I didn't dare to tell them that they'd got it all wrong, because I didn't know how long my own faith would last. After my friends disrobed, I became resigned. You're on your own now, I said to myself. Pulled out my copy of the Patimokha, which are the 227 training rules of the monk, which... um, we all, or m- many of us, will tend to uh, memorize and then recite uh, fortnightly uh, to the community. Pulled out my copy of the Padimokha and started to memorize it. It was easier than before with nobody teasing me or fooling around. I was able to concentrate on it fully. I didn't say anything, but I made a resolution that from that day onwards until the end of my life, whether it be at the age of 70 or 80 or whatever, I would try to practice with a constant appreciation, not allow my efforts to slacken or my faith to weaken, to be consistent. That is an extremely difficult task, and I didn't dare to tell anyone else. People came and went, and I said nothing. I merely watched impassively, but in my mind I was thinking, they don't see clearly. However, Ajahn Chah had his own problems. 
Food was a major craving in those early days. Haney says, It's not a smooth ride when you're practicing. You suffer. The first and second years are especially hard. The young monks and the small novices really go through it. I suffered myself a lot. If you've got a problem with food, it's rough. I became a monk when I was 20. That's the age when, who can deny it, you really enjoy food and sleep. Sometimes I just sit there quietly dreaming about things I'd like to eat. <laughs> Pounded Dene bananas, green papaya salad, all kinds of things. The saliva would be flowing like a river in my mouth. <laughs> I remember one story he told uh, uh, when I remember him, remember him telling that where he was still in the village monastery and, and uh, using money, having, having, having money, and, and, uh, uh, and then going to uh, a local uh, shop, uh, noodle shop, and, uh, which is a big kind of treat, in, especially if you're from the villages uh, in, in, in Thailand, uh, sort of Chinese noodles, it's a big deal. And uh, and he said, he said, yeah, I went into that shop. He said, close the doors. I'm going to eat noodles today. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, he said I, and somebody asked him, so well, how much did you eat? He said, I had seven bowls. He said, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ajahn Chah's father, Poma was proud to have a son in the robes, and whenever Ajahn Chah visited home, would always encourage him in his efforts and make the request. Please don't disrobe, Venerable Sir. I invite you to stay as a monk indefinitely. And then Ajahn Jayasaro makes a comment. This is a deliberately literal translation. It is hard to convey in English the tenor of a conversation between a Thai monk and his parents. Filial piety is greatly stressed in Thai society, and the relationship between parents and children is generally warm and close. Yet, when the son becomes a monk, their way of relating to each other instantly and radically changes. The parents are now lay people. They sit on a lower seat at a respectful distance. They use honorifics when referring to their son and humble personal pronouns when referring to themselves. There is a formality and ritual air to their conversations that one from another culture might find odd and somewhat unnatural, and yet for a canny observer there is no question that behind the form the deep affection remains intact. It is perhaps precisely because of the closeness of family relations that such a stilted form is deemed necessary. Now, as he lay weak and shrunk, this is uh, Ajahn Chah's father is, is old and sick and, and on his deathbed. Now, as he lay weak and shrunken on his deathbed, Poma made the request once more. It was difficult for him to speak. He said, You've made the right choice. Don't change it. Lay life is full of all kinds of pain and difficulties. There's no real peace or contentment in it. Stay as a monk. On previous occasions, Ajahn Chah had always kept silent, his head slightly bowed, showing respect, but an unwillingness to announce such a commitment. This time, however, in a quiet voice, he replied, No, I won't disrobe. Why should I do that? His father's face relaxed into a warm, contented smile, and he drifted off to sleep. This would have been about... Ajahn Chah would have been a monk for about six years or maybe seven. I can't remember exactly. When Pa Ma discovered that Ajahn Chah's exams would take place shortly, he, he urged them to return to his monastery. But this request was refused. Instead, Ajahn Chah helped to nurse his father for the 13 more days and nights that the old man lingered on. It was December, when the days of a drained, subdued tone and a cold wind blows down from across the northeast from China, when first thing in the morning everyone lights fires outside their houses to warm themselves by, and, and Jew harp kites, anchored high in the air, utter their melancholy cry throughout the night. Finally one day, 
Palma's laboured breath stopped, making the wind outside the house sound even louder. It seemed clear that the death of Palma precipitated a crisis in Ajahn Chah's life. While nursing his father, Truz that Ajahn Chah had been studying academically found a grounding in his experience. The human body as a mere conglomeration of the elements of solidity, fluidity, heat and vibration. The inevitability of old age, sickness and death. Prominent features of passages learned by rote in the monastery. He now saw as concise. Undeniable articulations of the nature of his own father's life. And such teachings found a deep resonance in his heart. On his return to Wat, Wat Ban Nong Lak, which is where he was studying, uh, after the funeral, Ajahn Chah's concentration on his studies was frequently interrupted by vivid images of those days, the sufferings of his father's emaciated body in its final days, life's abrupt cessation, the stiff and doll-like corpse his father had become and its growing smell, the shards of bone amongst the cremation ashes, such memories must have welled up within him constantly. He felt imbued by a profound and sober sense of sadness, determined to dedicate his life to the Dhamma and to be free of the cycle of conditioned existence. He made a solemn resolve, and this is Ajahn Chah's words, I dedicate my body and mind, my whole life, to the practice of the Lord Buddha's teachings in their entirety. I will realize the truth in this lifetime. I will let go of everything and follow the teachings. No matter how much suffering and difficulty I have to endure, I will persevere. Otherwise, there will be no end to my doubts. I must make this life as even and continuous as a single day and night. I will abandon attachments to mind and body and follow the Buddha's teachings until I know the truth for myself. I think that was one of Ajahn Chah's uh, probably singular qualities, is his uh, tremendous resolution, um, incredible dedication, um, that, uh, that willingness to, to just take things to their, their uh, take them to their end, and not to... Uh, uh, not just do things in, in a half-hearted way. And, uh, of course, that's why he's turned into such a great teacher for, for, for so many people. Um, for right now, I think that uh, uh, we could probably have a, uh, a period of... of uh, sitting meditation, although I'm looking at something else, well, maybe one last thing, because that, uh, there's, Ajahn Chah then went, um, from that time, he started to wander as a, he wanted to, um, uh, he didn't want to stay in a village monastery. He didn't want to stay in a study monastery. He wanted to practice. And there weren't many practice monasteries to go to. Um, there weren't many places that were, were, were so focused on, on meditation. Um, uh, so that uh, he wasn't quite sure where to go or what to do. So, but he'd heard, of course, in, in, in the culture and in the... the uh, uh, um, you know, there is this passed on knowledge of you know, there are these teachers in these different places and, and uh, so he went um, uh, wandering with a friend of his uh, and uh, they ended up in central Thailand which is it's a long walk in those days um, there was, uh, if you were a monk and you, you just put your your alms bowl your your robes, um, a mosquito net, and uh, and a uh, 
uh, umbrella, and then you you wandered and uh, wandered from village to village, and and then uh, uh, practiced in places that seemed suitable. And uh, he did uh, stay in a, a uh, stay in a uh, um, uh, a very good monastery in in central Thailand. And that's when he started to hear about um, Ajahn Man, who's uh, considered the kind of great uh, um, r reviver of the forest tradition in, in the northeast of Thailand, and a, uh, a great teacher uh, who inspired many, many uh, uh, other teachers. And... Uh, Ajahn Chah went, um, uh, the monastery that he was staying at was Wat Ka Wongkot. And, uh, uh, and he, Ajahn Jayasaro begins this chapter with a verse from the, or this section with a verse from the Dhammapada. An intelligent person, even though associated with a wise man only for a moment, quickly understands the Dhamma, just as the tongue knows the taste of soup. <laughs> so during his stay at Wat Ka Wongkot, Ajahn Chah first heard the name of the monk who was to become a legendary figure in Thailand, the most revered monk of his generation. Today on the shrines of houses, shops and offices throughout the country, a photograph of Lumpu Man. Uh, Lumpu is like Venerable Grandfather. Uh, it's, it's, given, it's, it's a very it's a special term of, of uh, reverence and uh, respect. Of Lumpu Man can commonly be seen in a place of honor, just below the Buddha himself. In it you see a slight figure, dressed in the somber robes of the forest monk, standing almost ghost-like amongst unearthly trees, his hands clasped in front of him, radiating an austere composure and an ethereal stillness. He seems to be looking right through the camera and into the deepest recesses of your heart. It is an inspiring but discomforting picture. It challenges all that you take for granted. The impression of Lumpu Man conveyed by the stories and anecdotes re related by those who knew him is startin startlingly reminiscent of the accounts of great monks found in the Buddhist scriptures. Even after making allowances for the bias of loyal disciples, such comparisons are not fanciful. Lumpu Man was, for all sixty years or so, sixty or so years of his monastic career, an exemplar of the ascetic peripatetic existence that we associate with the monks of the Buddha's time. He was in his mid seventies before he spent two consecutive rain retreats, rains retreats in the same monastery. Only at the very end of his life, when he could no longer walk, did he give up his daily alms round. His psychic powers were apparently stupendous. His wisdom, to use the traditional simile, was as sharp and penetrating as a diamond sword. He is credited with the highest realization of Dhamma. For most Thais, Lumpu Man represents the incontrovertible truth, incontrovertible tr proof that enlightenment exists and is attainable in this day and age. The forest tradition has never disappeared from Thailand, but before Lumpu Man, forest monks were always scattered in small, isolated communities that possessed little sense of a wider tradition. These sanghas tended to be centered around a charismatic teacher and after his death rarely survived for more than two or three generations. There are no records to tell us how many such groups have assembled and dispersed in the last 700 years. We will never know how many enlightened beings have come and gone. In the words of the Buddha himself, like birds crossing the sky, they left no tracks. Lumpu Man, however, lived at the beginning of a more connected, informed, and time-ridden age. Accounts of his practice and teachings have been recorded in many books. A number of fine training monasteries have been established by his disciples throughout the Northeast, which attracts visitors and pilgrims from all over the country. He may be an unfathomable figure to many, but he is not obscure. The high standards maintained by the monks of his lineage and the integrity and prowess of his greatest disciples 
has ensured that today there is a respect for forest monks that has not existed in the country since the Sukhothai period, which is around 1200 or 1300. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the Thai forest lineage as we know it was established almost single-handedly by Lumpu Man. But in the late 1940s, he was still relatively unknown. Throughout his monastic life, Lumpu Man shunned fame and status like a pestilent disease. Fifteen years earlier, while staying at Wat Jedi Luang, one of the oldest and most prestigious monasteries in Chiang Mai, he had received a letter from the powers that be in Bangkok informing him of his, his appointment as abbot. The next day he disappeared into the mountains <laughs> and was not seen in the city again for a number of years. <laughs> Lumpu Man was often a fierce and exacting teacher. teacher. His scoldings were famous. In his disciple Lumpa, Lumpa Mahabua, Lumpa Mahabua's memorable phrase, they, quote, shriveled your liver, unquote. <laughs> And yet he inspired a quiet but intense devotion from all who knew him. Now, Ajahn Chah learned from an old layman at Wat Kao Wongkot, Lumpu Man had returned to the northeast after ten years of solitary wandering in the north, and a large group of monks had gathered around him in the Pupan Mountains of Sekonakon. Ajahn Chah's plans for the cold season crystallized. At the end of the retreat, Ajahn Chah together with three other monks and novices and two laymen, set off on the long walk back to the northeast. They broke the journey at Bangkok and after a few days' rest, began a 250-kilometer hike northwards. By the tenth day, they had reached the elegant white stupa of Tat Panom, an ancient pilgrimage spot on the banks of the Mekong, and paid homage to the Buddha's relics enshrined there. They continued their walk in stages, by now finding forest monasteries along the way in which to spend the night. Even so, it was an arduous trek, and the novice and the layman asked to turn back. The group consisted of just three monks and a layman when they finally arrived at Wat Pu, Wat Pu Nong Na Nai, the home, the home of Lumpu Man. As they walked into the monastery, Ajahn Chah was immediately struck by its tranquil and secluded atmosphere. The central area in which stood a small meeting hall was immaculately, sw immaculately swept and the few monks they caught sight of were attending to their daily chores silently with a measured and composed gracefulness. There was something about the monastery that was like no other that he had been in before. The silence was strangely charged and vibrant. Ajahn Chah and his companions were received politely and after being advised where to put up their uh, mosquito nets took a welcome bath to wash off the grime of the road. In the evening, the three young monks, their double-layered outer robes folded neatly over their left shoulders, minds fluctuating between keen anticipation and cold fear, made their way to the wooden sala, to pay, that's a meeting hall, to pay respects to Lumpu Man. Crawling on his knees toward the great master, flanked on both sides by the resident monks, Ajahn Chah approached a slight and aged figure with an indomitable diamond-like presence. It is easy to imagine Lumpu Man's bottomless eyes and his deeply penetrating gaze boring into Ajahn Chah as he bowed three times and sat down at a suitable distance. Most of the monks were sitting with their eyes closed in meditation. One sat slightly behind Lumpu Man, slowly fanning away the evening's mosquitoes. As Ajahn Chah glanced up, he would have noticed how prominently Lumpu Man's collarbone jutted through the pale skin above his robe and how his thin mouth, stained, with, stained red with beetle juice, formed su such an arresting contrast to the strange luminosity of his presence. As is the time-honored custom among Buddhist monks, Lumpu Man first asked the visitors how long they had been in the robes, the monasteries they had practiced in, and the details of their journey. Did they have any doubts about the practice? Ajahn Chah swallowed. Yes, he did. He had been studying Vinaya texts, those are the books of discipline, Vinaya texts with great enthusiasm, but had become discouraged. The discipline seemed too detailed to be practical. It didn't seem possible to keep every single rule. What should one standard be? Lupu Man advised Ajahn Chah to take the two guardians of the world, Hiri, in, in Pali, which is conscience, and Otapa, intelligent fear of consequences, uh, 
as his basic principle. In the presence of the, those two virtues, he said, everything else would follow. He then began to discourse on the threefold training of virtue, meditation, and wisdom. The four roads to success, that's, um, let's say, desire, effort, application of mind, and investigation, and the five spiritual powers, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. Eyes half closed, his voice becoming stronger and faster as he proceeded, as if he was moving into a higher and higher gear. With an absolute authority, he described the way things truly are and the path to liberation. Ajahn Chah and his companions sat completely enwrapped. Ajahn Chah later said that although he had spent an exhausting day on the road, hearing Lumpu Man's Dhamma talk made all of his weariness disappear. His mind became peaceful and clear, and he felt as if he was floating in the air above his seat. It was late at night before Lumpu Man called the meeting to an end, and Ajahn Chah returned to his, to his mosquito net aglow. On the second night, Lumpu Man gave more teachings, and Ajahn Chah felt that he had come to, an, to come to the end of his doubts about the practice that lay ahead. He felt a joy and rapture in the Dhamma that he had never known before. Now what remained was for him to put his knowledge into practice. Indeed, one of the teachings that had inspired him the most on those two evenings was this injunction to make himself a witness to the truth. But the most clarifying explanation, one that gave him the necessary context or basis for practice that he had been hitherto lacking, was of a distinction between the mind itself and transient, and transient states of mind which arose and passed away within it. And then Ajahn Chah um, says himself, Lumpa Man said they're merely states. Through not understanding that point, we take them to be real, to be the mind itself. In fact, they're all just transient states. As soon as he said that, things suddenly became clear. Suppose there's happiness present in the mind. It's a different kind of thing. It's on a different level to the mind itself. If you see that, th that then you can stop, you can put things down. When conventional realities are seen for what they are, then it's ultimate truth. Most people lump everything together as the mind itself, but actually there are states of mind together with the knowing of them. If you understand that point, then there's not a lot to do. On the third day, Ajahn Chah paid his respects to Lumpu Man and led his small group off into the lonely forest of Pupan once more. He left the monastery behind him, never to return again, but with his heart full of an inspiration that stay, would stay with him for the rest of his life. So. so we could take this opportunity to take some of those teachings, examples, and, and uh, sit quietly. of a, uh, a bit of a instruction that uh, Ajahn Chah uh, gave at one point for sitting meditation. <laughs> Just keep breathing in and out like this. Don't be interested in anything else. It doesn't matter, even if someone is standing on their head with their ass in the air. Don't pay any attention. Just stay with the in-breath and the out-breath. Concentrate your awareness on the breath. Just keep doing it. Don't take up anything else. 
There's no need to think about gaining things. Don't take up anything at all. Simply know the in-breath and the out-breath. The in-breath and the out-breath. Put on the in-breath, toe on the out-breath. This is a common uh, meditation technique in the, using the name of the Buddha in conjunction with the breath. Just stay with the breath in this way until you are aware of the in-breath and aware of the out-breath. Aware of the in-breath aware of the out-breath. Be aware in this way until the mind is peaceful, without irritation, without agitation, merely the breath going out and coming in. Let your mind remain in this state. You don't need a goal yet. This is the first stage of practice. If the mind is at ease, at peace, then it will naturally be aware. As you keep staying with it, the breath diminishes, becomes softer. The body becomes pliable. The mind becomes pliable. It's a natural process. Sitting is comfortable. You're not dull. You don't nod. You're not sleepy. The mind has a natural ease with whatever it does. It is still. It's at peace. What follows along with us is called sati, the power of mindfulness, and sampajanya, self-awareness. Whatever we say or do, wherever we go, on alms round or whatever, while eating a meal, washing our alms bowl, then be aware of what it's all about. Be constantly mindful. Follow the mind. Sit straight. Watch the inhalation to its full extent until it completely disappears in the abdomen. When the inhalation is complete, then allow the breath out until the lungs are empty. Don't force it. It doesn't matter how long or, hard or, long or short or soft the breath is. Let it be just right for you. Sit and watch the inhalation and the exhalation. Make yourself comfortable with that. Don't allow your mind to get lost. If it gets lost, then stop. Look to see where it's got to, why it is not following the breath. Go after it and bring it back. Get it to stay with the breath and, without doubt, one day you will see the reward. Just keep doing it. Do it as if you won't gain anything, as if nothing will happen, as if you don't know who's doing it, but keep doing it anyway. Like rice in the barn, you take it out and sow it in the fields, as if you were throwing it away. Sow it throughout the fields without being interested in it. And yet it sprouts. Rice plants grow up. You transplant it and you've got sweet green rice. That's what it's about. This is the same. Just sit there. Sometimes you might think, why am I watching the breath so intently? Even if I didn't watch it, it would still keep going in and out. Well, you'll always find something to think about. That's a view. It's an expression of the mind. 
forget it. Keep trying over and over again and make the mind peaceful. Once the mind is at peace, the breath will diminish, the body will become relaxed, the mind will become subtle. They will be in a state of balance until it will seem as if there's no breath, but nothing happens to you. When you reach this point, don't panic, don't get up and run off because you think you've stopped breathing. It just means that your mind is at peace. You don't have to do anything. Just sit there and look at whatever is present.
So we could have a period of uh, walking meditation and uh, this is uh, uh, certainly uh, plays a, a big role in in uh, forest monasteries um, the uh, uh, Ajahn Cha himself um, would uh, was a big proponent of walking meditation, and um, he would uh, you know, greatly encourage it. A lot of it is is uh, uh, also as a means for cultivating that quality of continuity, like a continuity of mindfulness and clear comprehension. Uh, sitting, walking, sitting, so then one has has that that uh, say that opportunity because if one one just can't sit all the time, and uh, it helps to be able to change posture and then to um, develop and sustain that quality of attention through these activities of sitting and walking then using that as the base, then one can also bring that out into other things that we do. Um, so the walking meditation plays a, a, a big role in, certainly in uh, uh, Ajahn Chah's monasteries. Um, one of the, uh, and forest monasteries in general. Um, if anybody's been to a Bayagiri monastery you'll, and gone around to the dwelling places, you'll notice that each dwelling place in the forest has a walking meditation path right in the vicinity. And it'll be about uh, about 40 or 50 feet long, a flat area that's cleared. Uh, and, uh, and you use that for, so you come back uh, after the meal, um, then uh, you do walking meditation. You go and sit after the meal, you can be almost assured of one thing, you're going to fall asleep. Um, or uh, it's depending on person's rhythms, uh, could be early evening, late evening, uh, you try sitting too long and pretty soon sort of that Pillow is going to be calling out to you. you know, Come here, <laughs> and uh, it's to be able to do walking meditation. Get the energy going. Get the concentration going. Get the mindfulness going, in a in a posture that's not so tranquil. Um, so that Ajahn Chah would would uh, would in, encourage it and. Uh, um, I remember him giving this uh, one particular talk, um, and uh, uh, it was um, as uh, in my time there were more and more uh, students and more people from uh, more monks from Central Thailand, uh, more. Uh, Westerners, and uh, he would, a lot of the time he would use Central Thai language to speak. Uh, but when he really wanted to express himself, then it was in the Northeastern dialect, his home tongue, mother tongue. And this particular talk, uh, it was all in his Northeastern dialect, and I can remember it really clearly because by that time, I could understand it quite well, and um, he was uh, he was giving everybody a bad time, <laughs> and he wanted to get it across, and it doesn't come across in polite Central Thai. <laughs> uh, and I remember him this this one point. He said, "You know, I've gone around. I've looked at the at the at the uh, at all the you know, the different." Huts in the forest where you you monks live. And I said, you know, I 
see the, the walking meditation paths, and I don't see human tracks. All I see is dog tracks. <laughs> What's up with you? Why aren't you doing walking meditation? <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> so he had, uh, you know, was, that was a sign. Of, if the practice was slipping, you, you, weren't doing, you weren't doing your walking meditation. You weren't, you weren't sort of getting, getting into that rhythm of keeping continuity of practice going. Um, there's one uh, in this same uh, talk that I had uh, read the meditation, the walking, med- uh, the sitting meditation instruction. Um, he talks about uh, wa- walking meditation as well. He said, "Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Do it often. After the meal, air your robe on a line and get straight out onto the walking meditation path. Keep thinking, Bhutto, Bhutto." Think it all the time that you're walking. Concentrate on Bhutto as you walk. Wear the path down. Wear it down until it's a trench and it's halfway up your calves or up to your knees. Just keep walking. <laughs> uh, just that, uh, get out there and do it. <laughs> so that uh, in walking meditations, so as you change posture, uh, yeah, just go out and find a, a quiet spot under the trees, along the trails. Um, and uh, you usually clasp one's hands in front, keep, the, he- keep the, the gaze down, and have that sense of composing the body. Because it's when one composes the body that one helps to compose the mind. You can't separate the two. The body and mind, are, are uh, they, they work together. And if you're going wandering along... Um, you know, the mind's going to be doing pretty much the same thing. <laughs> but just that, that you know, just composing the body, bringing it together, walking a bit slower than normal, and then just walking back and forth in a calm way. It's very, very settling and very conducive to uh, allowing the mind to, 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 to really develop that continuity of, of attention and awareness. Because that's, that's where we really... Um, start to see the Dhamma or taste the Dhamma is in that that continuity of of, of awareness. So we'll ring the bell to be back here at eleven fifteen for another sitting. So please join the sitting.
So we'll continue the morning with another sitting. And uh, <coughs> I'll do a, another bit of a reading from Ajahn Chah and uh, his uh, uh, advice in, in meditation. Um, as we've been reading the story, then um, he's been a village monk um, doing study, uh, not much meditation. And then he's gone out and tried to figure out um, where to find guidance, where to find instruction, how to uh, meditate and practice, how to make the best use of his uh, taking on the taking on the robes, taking on his ordination. And uh, he's just uh, spent a bit of time with Ajahn Man, and that has um, given him um, a real uh, anchor uh, for him to train with now. And uh, of course, uh, he's got um, much time to uh, experiment and practice and train, make mistakes, uh, and uh, figure out what what's actually going to work for him. What's actually going to work uh, in the uh, in the in the in accordance with Dhamma. And I'll, these are his words. In meditation, things which usually aren't wrong can be wrong. For example, we sit down cross-legged with determination and resolve. All right. No pussyfooting around this time. I'll concentrate my mind. Just watch me. No way that approach will work. <laughs> Every time I tried that, my meditation got nowhere. But we love the bravado. From what I've observed, meditation will develop at its own rate. Many evenings as I sat down to meditate, I thought to myself, all right, tonight I won't budge from this spot until at least 1 a.m. Even with this thought, I was already making some bad karma because it wasn't long before the pain in my body attacked from all sides, overwhelming me until I felt like I was going to die. However, those occasions when the meditation went well were times when I didn't place any limits on the sitting. I didn't set a goal of 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, or 9 o'clock, or whatever, but simply kept sitting, steadily carrying on, letting go with equanimity. Don't force the meditation. Don't attempt to interpret what's happening. Don't coerce your heart with unrealistic demands that it enter a state of samadhi. Or else you find, you'll find it even more agitated and unpredictable than normal. Just allow the heart and mind to relax, comfortable and at ease. Allow the breathing to flow easily at just the right pace neither too short nor too long. Don't try to make it into anything special. Let the body relax, comfortable and at ease. Then keep doing it. Your mind will ask you, how late are we going to meditate tonight? <laughs> what time are we going to quit? 
it incessantly nags. So you have to bellow out a reprimand. Listen, buddy, just leave me alone. This busybody questioner needs to be regularly subdued because it's nothing other than defilement coming to annoy you. Don't pay it any mind whatsoever. You have to be tough with it. Whether I call it quits early or have a late night, it's none of your damn business. <laughs> if I want to sit all night, it doesn't make any difference to anyone. So why do you come and stick your nose into my meditation? You have to cut the nosy fellow off like that. You can then carry on meditating for as long as you wish, according to what feels right. As you allow the mind to relax and be at ease, it becomes peaceful. Experiencing this, you'll recognize and appreciate the power of clinging. When you can sit on and on for a very long time, going past midnight, comfortable or relaxed, you'll know you're getting the hang of meditation. You'll understand how attachment and clinging really do defile the mind. When some people sit down to meditate, they, li they light a stick of incense in front of them and vow, I won't get up until this stick of incense is burned down. Then they sit. After what seems like an hour, they open their eyes and realize only five minutes have gone by. They stare at the incense, disappointed at how exceedingly long the stick is. <laughs> they close their eyes again and continue. Soon their eyes are open once more to check in that stick of incense. These people don't get anywhere in meditation. Don't do it like that. Just sitting and dreaming about that stick of incense, I wonder if it's almost finished burning. The meditation gets nowhere. Don't give importance to such things. The mind doesn't have to do anything special. If we are going to undertake the task of developing the mind in meditation, don't let the defilement of craving know the ground rules or the goal. How will you meditate, Venerable? It inquires. How much will you do? How late are you thinking of going? Craving keeps pestering until we submit to an agreement. Once we declare we're going to sit until midnight, it immediately begins, begins to hassle us. Before even an hour has passed, we're feeling so restless and impatient that we can't continue. Then more hindrances attack as we berate ourselves. Hopeless. What? Is sitting going to kill you? You said you were going to make your mind unshakable in samadhi, but it's still unreliable and all over the place. You made a vow and you didn't keep it. Thoughts of self-deprecation and dejection assail our minds and we sink into self-hatred. There's no one else to blame or get angry at and, they may, and that makes it all the worse. Once we make a vow, we have to keep it. We either fulfill it or die in the process. If we do vow to sit for a certain length of time, then we shouldn't break that vow and stop. In the meantime, however, just gradually practice and develop. There's no need for making dramatic vows. Try to steadily and persistently train the mind. Occasionally, the, mind will, the meditation will be peaceful and all the aches and discomfort in the body will vanish. The pain in the ankles and knees will cease by itself. The contemplation that leads to the Dhamma is the contemplation of conditionality, the process of cause and effect. In all its various manifestations, both major and minor, black and white, good and bad, in short, everything, when you think, recognize it as a thought and contemplate that it's merely that, nothing more. All these things wind up in the graveyard of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not-self. So don't possessively cling to any of them. This is the cremation ground of all phenomena. Bury and cremate them in order to experience the truth.
Ajahn Chah also says, Meditation is like a single stick of wood. Insight is one end of the stick, the vipassana, and serenity, samatha, is the other. Insight has to proceed from peace and tranquility. The entire process will happen naturally of its own accord. We can't force it. In my own search, I tried nearly every possible means of contemplation. I sacrificed my life for the Dhamma because I had faith in the reality of enlightenment and the path to get there. But to realize them takes practice, right practice. It takes pushing yourself to the limit. It takes the courage to train, to reflect, and to fundamentally change. It takes the courage to actually do what it takes. You've got to discover it in the depths of your own heart.
Hmm. It was very quiet and still. Um, so the next part of the program uh, is the one interesting thing that happens in a monk's day. <laughs> So the uh, the time for the for the meal offering, and uh, as most people probably know, um, but just to um, speak about it a bit, that the uh, for monastics and we we live dependent on the generosity of the lay community and uh, our uh, meal of the day is provided by people uh, giving and uh, say for somebody like uh, Ajahn Chah um, as a wandering monk then he would wander and you would give a sort of wander into a nearby village in the morning and you're never quite sure what you're going to receive. Um, or you wander into a Spirit Rock Meditation Center and you're never quite sure what you're going to receive. Um, and it's completely dependent on the uh, generosity of, of others. Um, so this is a, a long a long tradition, and uh, um, that's what our, say, our alms bowls are for receiving food and eating, eating the food that we've been offered. Um, and I know that uh, when I asked Ajahn Amaro uh, how he uh, 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 sculptured the days, uh, then uh, uh, he said that uh, um, people came up and put food in the bowl. And uh, I'm going to, because there's so many of us, um, and he said it take, can take a long time, um, but uh, because there's so many uh, monastics here today, and as well as lay people, um, the, uh, I'd like to do it as we do at the monastery. And... Uh, uh, if if people do have offerings uh, that they would like to make, if it could be, uh, I'll have the monks all go back uh, and receive it at the tables. Then, when it's all been formally received, that's as part of the um, say our our discipline. Um, we actually can only eat that which we've has been offered to us formally into our hands. We can't go, say, if we go stay at somebody's house, we can't go scrounging in the refrigerator and <laughs> see what we can find that's interesting. It's uh, uh, things that has to be formally offered. And um, so that the, I'll invite the monks to go back and uh, receive the offerings. And, uh, um, and, then, uh, and then we'll go, once it's been formally received, then we'll take our bowls and go and put them in our bowls, come back and offer the, uh, the meal blessing. And uh, the, uh, the alms bowls are, uh, um, say, one of, we don't have many required requisites, uh, and that is one of them. Uh, there is mine right there. Uh, and uh, we have our, basically our robes and our, our bowls, which are really required. And uh, Ajahn Chah would, uh, would, well, in actually in the rules of discipline, there's a lot of care taken in looking after the, the uh, uh, the bowls, looking after the robes, um, again, because these are our offerings that sustain our life, then they're, they're a focal part, point of, for our cultivation of 
mindfulness and, and attention. Um, but they're also um, what sustain our, our, our livelihood. There's a... Uh, I remember one time uh, at uh, Ajahn Chah's monastery, and uh, in Thailand there's a there's quite a cult of say like amulets and power objects, and something that has been blessed or created by a, a highly revered monk is very sought after, and people were always trying to get Ajahn Chah to either create some amulets uh, or bless amulets that have been made so that they could be um, um, distributed. And usually somebody makes a lot of money along the way too, uh, <laughs> and usually not the monks. Um, so that uh, uh, there was one time when uh, um, a group of uh, military generals uh, with the head of the army um, uh, sort of at the top of the committee uh, came up with this brilliant idea that they would uh, uh, make these amulets because they knew Ajahn Chah wouldn't make them so they'd make the amulets and then they would present them to Ajahn Chah and then they would uh, say that whatever proceeds came from that, then it would be given to a foundation that would be for supporting the monks and nuns at Wat Bapong, uh, particularly at the, for the kitchen, which actually in those days um, was just sort of on the cusp of the, when Ajahn Chah was uh, becoming quite well known. Um, he was already well known in terms of people wanting to Go forth so that there was when I was um, living there in the in, in that particular time, uh, there would usually could be 80, 90 monks, 50, 60 nuns uh, living at Wapa, and there was like I think there was like 70 dwelling places for the monks and 40, 45 for the nuns, so that people were willing to sort of sleep out in the forest just to be close to Ajahn Chah. Uh, but the, the um, say Ajahn Chah's reputation hadn't spread so much outside of that realm that he was getting a huge amount of support. Uh, so that sometimes it was, it was slim pickings uh, at, for, the, for the meals. And uh, they thought, this, We've got a way. Ajahn Chah will be compassionate towards his monks and nuns, so we'll be able to get these amulets done. So they came as de uh, deputation of generals and came and paid respects to Ajahn Chah, and he, uh, he laid out their plan. and uh, And he said, uh, "Well, that's that's an interesting idea. Uh, why don't I keep them here?" And uh, I can't make this decision myself. Uh, it's really the, the whole community that has to make the decision. And uh, so they sort of, okay. Uh, so they, he set the time of, uh, uh, it was the, the full moon of February, which is a special uh, day, uh, Maga Puja, and many people come to the monastery. So it was after the, recitation of the monks' discipline, um, all of the senior monks of uh, Ajahn Chahs were from, came from the branch monasteries, which the, in those days, that, would the ta that was the day that, that they came together. And uh, they, uh, um, so we finished the recitation of discipline. Ajahn Chah let uh, people know what was happening. Uh, these sort of generals troop in and, um, you know, they look pretty cocky and pretty sure of what's going to happen. And Ajahn Chah sort of gave him a bit of a, um, some introduction and uh, said what they were doing and their good intentions. And then uh, and he asked, well, 
different senior monks uh, what they thought of the idea. And of course, everybody shot it down. <laughs> and you could see these, these faces just sort of changing. And, uh, and then finally, after many of the, the senior monks had spoken, um, Ajahn Chah then talked with them and uh, he said, you know, there's, I mean, he gave a very lovely talk uh, and, you know, uh, praising their, their good intentions, but he said there's no real need to be setting up a foundation to look after the monastery or to look after the monks. Actually, the Buddha set up the foundation 2,500 years ago. Um, in, and in Thai, the, the word for a monk's bowl is bat. And for anybody who's gone to Thailand, the currency is also bat. So he said, the Buddha set up the foundation 2,500 years ago with just one bat. <laughs> so just with this one, with this one alms bowl, it's been looking after, these alms bowls have been looking after the Sangha for, for all this time. Um, so that, uh, he said, uh, you don't have to worry about it. All of those amulets that were given, uh, Ajahn Chah kept them, set them aside. Uh, when he died, they were buried in the, in the, in the uh, there's a, a stupa in the middle at Wat Papong, very large, and there's an area where underneath the relics of Ajahn Chah in this plinth, uh, then all of those amulets are in there, <laughs> buried under concrete and, and granite. So. <laughs> so we brought our, our found, sort of the, the foundation that Buddha, the Buddha gave to us today and with us. And uh, if anybody would like to make offerings, I'll invite the monks to go back and uh, receive, and then we'll uh, uh, take our bowls and, and receive those offerings. Go ahead. It's really just...